Let's discuss an update to the Omicron pandemic and a little bit more on today's episode. First, let's talk about Omicron. The U.S. reached a record of hospitalizations as it pertains to this pandemic. We've reached over 132,000 hospitalizations. I just got back from the hospital. But deaths, although I hate talking about death, remain stagnant. When you look at hospitalizations for Omicron, here's what's interesting. First of all, in New York, 42% of the people hospitalized are incidentally found to have SARS-CoV-2. This means something other than COVID brought them in. The other thing is everyone is getting infected, but they all remain at home with a bad cold. So remember, this is almost what we wanted. I am only at a few hospitals in Southern California, but our ICU is not overrun with COVID. Why? Let's go to South Africa for some data during their surge of Omicron. Comparing their Omicron surge to the Delta surge, here are some numbers that they discovered. The length of stay on average was 8.8 days during the Delta surge, but only four days during the Omicron surge. 99.5% of their admitted patients needed oxygen during the Delta wave. However, only 45% needed oxygen during their Omicron surge. In another study, they looked at 2,500 patients compared to 6,000 patients during Delta. Similar data was seen. 31% presented with an acute respiratory condition compared with 91% during the Delta wave. 17% needed oxygen compared with 74% during the Delta wave. Now, most of the patients that were admitted were unvaccinated, 66% of them. In the United States, 90% of the patients in the Cleveland Clinic ICU are unvaccinated. It remains important to receive your vaccination and your booster, but with effective early therapies, please understand if you have risk factors for severe disease. These include hypertension, diabetes, obesity, BMI greater than 25, chronic lung disease, chronic neurological disease, immunocompromised, over the age of 65, chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease, and dependent on machines to live, PEG2 mechanical ventilation. If you have any of these, you qualify for monoclonal antibodies if you test positive or for post-exposure prophylaxis. The most effective monoclonal antibody as it pertains to Omicron is actually Sotrovimab. You likely qualify from molnupiravir and Paxlovid. Molnupiravir is basically a nucleoside derivative that inhibits viral replication. Paxlovid, as I've talked about before, is two protease inhibitors, nermotrevir and rinotavir. Because SARS-CoV-2 is a positive sense RNA virus, after it binds to our cells and spits its genome into our cytoplasm, which is inside the cell, the RNA is immediately translated or converted into protein. To be a little more specific, the replicase gene which includes open reading frame 1A and open reading frame 1B, is immediately translated into two large polyproteins named polyprotein 1A and polyprotein 1AB. These polyproteins are the non-structural proteins of the virus bound together. Imagine a string of hot dogs held together by casings. You're gonna sell them one by one by cutting at the site where the casing is holding on to another hot dog. In SARS-CoV-2, the protein responsible for the cutting is called non-structural protein 5, or 3C-like protease. It cleaves 11 different sites, freeing these individuals' non-structural proteins so they can do their job, continue to infect the body. Paxlovid, which again includes rinotavir and nermotrovir, inhibits NSP5 so the proteins can't be freed, remain locked up, and the virus dies. Rinotavir is in the compound to inhibit the liver's metabolism of nermotrovir so it sticks around to kill the virons. All of this leads to a reduction of hospitalization and death by 89%. Please understand these drugs are available. Just a couple of updates to consider since we are posting this new episode about Omicron, COVID, and kind of just COVID updates in general. So we now know that sotrovimab is pretty much the only monoclonal antibody that has an EUA for acute infection. So that's the monoclonal antibody you want to go after and you would like to use. We also know that Paxlovid and Molnupiravir are effective. So if you can get your hands on those PO products and you have an acute infection and you have those risk factors for severe disease, you can do that as well. 
As it pertains to Omicron-specific boosters, here's something that I always kind of felt, but it's now proven, at least so far, in the medical literature. Omicron-specific boosters may not actually be any better than the mRNA vaccines we already have. In other words, when you compare the immunity generated from an mRNA booster that we already have out in circulation versus Omicron specificity, there doesn't seem to be that much of a difference. So you may not need an Omicron-specific vaccine. That's something that I feel is extremely important. Here's another thing. Hospitalizations across the United States are going down. So hopefully this trend can continue as we move forward during this pandemic. And hopefully we won't have another significant variant to deal with. As far as the BA2 variant, we don't know a whole lot about it yet, but we do know that it's out there. Do I think this is going to be a serious variant? I don't know. But as this information starts to come in, I will be sure to update all of you. Remember, as it pertains to this pandemic, vaccination is important. Understand your risk factors to obtain early therapy and understand that early therapies are effective. Mask up. Staffing issues in the hospital will continue to be prominent as more and more of us test positive for SARS-CoV-2. Our absence for a few days is essential to protect you. Thanks for joining today's episode of Medicine Deconstructed. I really appreciate you guys being here. We're here to arm you with some information. Please come back next week for some more ammunition. Thanks again.